conference where we will update you on the COVID-19 pandemic. Just before we go into a statement from our minister, I just want to again mention some housekeeping matters. We will again be limiting our time in this space. As such, we will be limiting the questions per journalist. And I thank you very much for your understanding and cooperation. Um, this is in keeping with the need for us not to be here for an extended period of time. I have realized as well that we are well spaced out according to the standard practice of being at least three to six feet apart. So that is very good. We have also placed a mic at the front here that persons who have questions, um, you can use the mic. Um, additionally, we have brought um, the hand sanitizer for you to sanitize your hands. Uh, I know that we, we have the mic at the front of the table here, so we can sanitize your hands. We also sanitize the handle of the mic. So we're taking all the necessary steps to ensure that you are comfortable and we're all safe in this case. As to how we will proceed, our honorable minister will give a brief statement and thereafter he will take questions and the chief medical officer, along with her team, our infectious disease specialist, Dr. Davey, our, our medical officer of health as well. And we also do have with us who we have co-opted, who's working along with us, Dr. Gerald Thompson, who can also be available. And our chief lab tech, should there be any questions within that sphere, can also respond. So without much delay, I am going to ask our Honorable Minister of Health, Wellness and Environment, Honorable Luke Brown, to come in with some brief statements. Thank you, P.S. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. The members of staff and the Ministry of Health Awareness and the Environment who are here, uh, especially invited guests and experts like Dr. Gerald Thompson, you know, this, uh, who has been opted, as the P.S. said, away from one of his passions in the medicinal cannabis industry. You know, he is, has an executive role in that area, but he's also a medical doctor and, a, and an expert. And we have with us today Chief Medical Officer in the Ministry, we have the Medical Officer of Health who just came in, Dr. Martin Lofton. Uh, we have Dr. Davey, and we have the Chief Laboratory Technologist, as has been mentioned by the Government Secretary. And of course, we have the PS himself. And we, we appreciate this opportunity for further engagement. Uh, you know that this, this press conference is being held against the backdrop of a significant day on the Global Health Calendar. May 5th was commemorated both as Hand Hygiene Day and as the National Day of the Midwife. In light of this fact, I'd just like to share briefly some comments which were made by Director General of the World Health Organization on Monday, on the eve of the 5th. He, he made the point, and it's a very relevant, relevant point in light of where we were on the calendar, that the fight against COVID-19, that the, one of the best tools for the fight against COVID-19 is also one of the most basic, clean hands. And he went on to say that the simple act of cleaning hands can be the difference between life and death and remains one of the most important public health measures for protecting individuals, families, and communities against COVID-19, but not just COVID-19, many other diseases. This emphasizes the importance of access to water, soap, and hand sanitizer. Largely, we have not had an issue with these things in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. However, there were some challenges on the waterfront in some parts of our country because of a prolonged dry season recently. And I'd like to thank and commend the Central Water and Sewage Authority for the work it did to keep the situation under control even when we were facing those difficulties, including through the delivery of water to some islands. On one occasion, I think it was up to 12,000 gallons of water was delivered to Byron, that was in 
important, not just from the standpoint of the basic sustenance of life on that island, but also because we needed it for the provision of health services. Tuesday, as I mentioned, was also International Day of the Midwives. It was International Hand Hygiene Day, and it was International Day of the Midwives. And I'd just like to express some appreciation for midwives as well from this forum. We will have an opportunity to more broadly speak and comment on and compliment our nurses for their services because next week, on Tuesday, I think it is. Well, for me, we have International Nurses Day. Uh, that day is time to coincide with the 200th anniversary of the birth of Florence Nightingale. She's a prominent nurse. We're actually in the middle of the International Year of the Nurse, which was so designated by the World Health Organization even before this pandemic. And the pandemic certainly gives us an idea of the utter appreciation of nurses and midwives, so we celebrate them and we celebrate all the other persons who are the front line. And to give you an, an idea of the, the importance or significance of, of midwives, even you might remember that in the Bible, in the book of Exodus, when the king of Egypt wanted to put some controls on the population of the children of Israel, he started to walk to the midwives. But fortunately, they, they did not opt to be a part of that design. But today, in St. Vincent and Grenadines, midwives help with childbirth and provide life saving interventions. They have contributed to St. Vincent and Grenadines having zero maternal deaths in both 2018 and 2019. They also have, they have also been vital for the provision of general health services, including our national response to COVID 19. Currently, St. Vincent and Grenadines has about 40 midwives and another 10 also nurses are being trained right now in a midwifery course. Clearly, the government is invested in the training of midwives, championing their rights, and supporting them in the performance of their duties. There was one also, there was one other recent international observance which I think is worth mentioning. And that's the fact that last week, the entire of last week, all of last week, was observed as vaccination week in the Americas. And I think it's fair to say that this ongoing coronavirus pandemic has given us a sense of how powerful vaccines can be for protecting the health of the world. If we go to just comment a bit on the COVID-19 situation in St. Vincent and Grenadines right now, as of this moment, and you may know if you've been following the reports, St. Vincent and Grenadines has had 17 confirmed cases of COVID-19. There have been nine recoveries, meaning that there are currently eight active cases. We discovered a cluster of five cases in a local community, and I think that at this stage, the health professionals are of the view that the full extent of the cluster has been more or less determined. And I should say that the discovery of a case of local transmission in this community triggered a targeted intervention and involving an aggressive form of testing, including the use of PCR tests and rapid testing, contact tracing, public education, and very importantly, clinical support. And I'd like to extend our thanks to everyone who helped with the response to that situation. And this is a point that I'd like to make by, by reference to uh, publication by the World Health Organization. I just need to get the guy on the stairs. I just think it is necessary for us to provide some information on the different transmission scenarios that could exist because there's been a discussion in Certain second means about transmission, transmission scenarios, and uh, the, there was some guidance published by the World Health Organization, and I referred to this at a earlier press conference. I think it was a press conference that we have right here at the NIS conference room. So it presents four transition, transmission scenarios: one, a situation of no cases; two, a situation where countries have 
one or more cases reported or locally detected. Three, where countries are experiencing cases, clusters of cases in time, geographic location, or common exposure. And four, where a country is experiencing large outbreaks of local transmission, which is typically referred to as community transmission. And the definition that is provided for clusters is where this is a scenario where most cases of local transmission are linked to chains of transmission. And I think that that has been established here. And very importantly, too, community transmission is described as a situation where there are outbreaks with the inability to relate multiple cases to chains of transmission for a large number of cases or by increasing positive tests to samples, routine systematic testing of respiratory samples from established laboratories, as in testing of samples that they refer to. So in St. Vincent, we do not have outbreaks with the inability to relate confirmed cases through chains of transmission for a large number of cases, which is why we said that we have local transmission here with the incidence of some clusters. And then just, just an important point to be made about our isolation center. The isolation center is more or less complete and, I, and, I, and patients can be transferred to that facility if necessary. We received an important piece of equipment for the isolation center recently, the incinerator. We have sorted out staff and arrangements and as I say, there could be the transfer of patients as necessary. We would know that the current situation is where we have only experienced mild cases and these patients are able to be managed in the home setting for the most part. So we will continue to manage those cases in that setting. We are also making arrangements for the reopening of the Kingston Clinic and there are several other areas of the health, health system that have been affected by, by COVID-19. And I noted with interest that on May 6, the World Health Organization, in conjunction with UNICEF and the International Federation of the Red Cross, published guidance for countries on how to maintain community-based health care in the context of COVID-19. So whatever is taking place, it is still necessary for us to maintain community-based health care and see how we could maximize the continued provision of other services to persons throughout the country. In the past few days, there have been several developments of note, including yesterday's return of essential nationals from the British Virgin Islands. And there's an ongoing conversation in our country about the repatriation of sailors. You know, you may already know about the group that returned yesterday, I think in the end, final numbers were 22 persons came in and uh, of those 22 persons, 18 persons are able to be self-quarantined in their own facilities and four of them are under quarantine at a public facility. It is well known that the government has been working hard to facilitate the safe return of the incension crew on cruise ships. A significant number of sailors from several ships are likely to be home by the end of the month. The relevant stakeholders are engaged and the protocols are in place. Where the reopening of schools is concerned, the Ministry of Education made a presentation to cabinet yesterday about the reopening of schools and the matter is being finalized. And I just wanted to, to make some comments generally about the lifting of lockdown. Uh, the exit from lockdown, so to speak. Lockdown is, a, is a, a word that has been used to describe the implementation of various uh, public health and social measures. And there's some guidance on the point of lockdown. For instance, public health measures could include various things, restrictions in terms of school <coughs> restrictions, on movement to different degrees, and we have seen various restrictions in different countries. And 
there are some criteria published by people, but you know that in Sydney, that you get means we, we never entered really in a full blown way, and certainly not in the way that we've seen elsewhere uh, a situation of lockdown. For instance, our airport has, properly speaking, never been closed. There have been limited flights in and out of the country because of suspension of services by several airlines. Notwithstanding that, we've had cargo services continue because we believe in a measured approach and that approach is reflected by the fact that persons who come into the country would be required to stay in quarantine for 14 days. We've asked persons to, to practice physical distancing. We have recommended the use of masks in public spaces that are crowded and where physical distancing is not possible. So, so these are all measures which were employed. Now, there is a, a discussion, as I mentioned, about moving out of a lockdown phase. Uh, and uh, it is really about the point of increasing the movement with certain limitations that may be required. And the World Health Organization has said that certain things need to be in place for us to be able to move in that direction including, and I've just mentioned the six points that they have highlighted. One, the COVID-19 transmission situation should be controlled to a level of sporadic cases and clusters of cases, all from known contacts or importations. So this is the situation in St. Vincent and Grenadines, and I think that we the Chief Medical Officer said in an interview yesterday that more or less the Caribbean, it was reported that in the Caribbean, we are largely together at this particular position. Two, sufficient public health workforce and health system capacities are in place, and in St. Vincent, we continue to try to continue to bolster our capacity, we bolster our capacity with the isolation center, we bolster our capacity with taking on additional nurses and in many other areas. So we are in a fairly good position where that is concerned. The third, the third standard outbreak risk in high vulnerability settings are minimized, and we have done work in that regard. Fourth, preventative measures are established in workplaces. And I think that if you go through St. Vincent Grenadines, you'll see some, some examples of the implementation of preventative measures. Fifth, manage the risk of exporting and importing cases from communities with high risk of transmission. That is already uh, more or less addressed through what we have by virtue of quarantine arrangements and other arrangements. And six communities are fully engaged and we continue to place emphasis on community outreach activities. So individuals have information on the basis of which they could make some decisions. So this being the case, it means that we could assess risk on an ongoing basis and in relation to particular activities and make a determination of how we should proceed in country. St. Vincent Grenadines has received a lot of support for its fight against COVID-19. Uh, I recently announced that Taiwan, the Republic of China, has, has donated four ventilators and 60,000 face masks as further assistance for the fight against COVID-19 incidents and Grenadines. You may remember that earlier Taiwan had given a significant quantity of locally sourced medical supplies, and they have also given, I think maybe about a week and a half or three to two weeks ago, a quantity of surgical masks and uh, thermal temperature devices that are being used, and they have come forward with a further gift of four ventilators and 60,000 face masks. We thank Taiwan and we thank all other countries who have come to our aid, including Venezuela, the Republic of the Republic of Venezuela, and the Republic of Cuba. You know that Cuba has provided staff and staff for the isolation center. So we have uh, a coalition of supporters in the form of countries, in the form of other developmental partners, and the local cooperate community. And, uh, non-cooperative community as well has responded to our nation at this time of need. The World Health Organization keeps saying, and rightly so, 
that the antidote to COVID-19 is unity and solidarity and the triumph of the human spirit. And I think that the evidence shows that we are in the right, moving in the right direction as far as unity and solidarity are concerned. So we are committed to our continued thrust to protect the health, welfare, and interests of the incentives at this time of COVID-19. And we call upon the public again to do your part to make sure that you keep your hands clean to the extent possible and practice all the other guidance and recommendations that have been provided from time to time for the prevention of the transmission of COVID-19. I think that the, the elements that we try to, to address in our overall strategy uh, for prevention could be summed up in, in a few simple statements. We're trying to control the introduction or the spread of the virus in our communities. We are trying to find cases and when we find those cases take certain follow-up actions with respect to their contacts and we'd like to ensure that everyone has access to the appropriate care that will help them deal with a COVID-19 uh, diagnosis. So far in St. Vincent and Grenadines we've been able to see several recoveries and I'm hoping that we see more recoveries we will continue to be vigilant in this matter and uh, take steps in the general public health interest. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. We have come to that stage where we will have questions from the yes. Um I place the mic here. And it also just, I mean, it's just a miss. So I'll sanitize the mic before you used it and maybe every time after so we can have an indication of the best times you identify yourself and the respective females that you're representing as well. Yes, and the news is listening. Um, my first um, question is to the Chief Medical Officer. Okay. Yes. Um, the Director General of the World Health Organization warned against politicizing COVID-19, and he also indicated you know, that there could be a situation in such politic politicizing of an increase in body bags. Right? And my question is, are you satisfied that your government has not been politicizing the COVID-19? And what advice do you have to give to your government on the issue of polit politicizing going forward? Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Chief Medical approach of the government is 
is certainly consistent with that advice, which is why, you know, I also keep saying it. You know, I also keep emphasizing the importance of unity and the importance of solidarity. So um, let's just get to it. Are you, are you um, conforming or denying anything and in terms of your government politicizing the COVID-19? Well, I think that the words, what, what I said, is to indicate that we emphasize unity as the appropriate approach for dealing with COVID-19. Accordingly, we can avoid anything that would polarize the situation. Um, just uh, another question to the Chief Medical Officer. Okay. Um, what is the biggest challenge facing this country in responding to the impact of COVID-19?
Um, President, good morning, and thank you for that question regarding testing negative and testing positive. As we know, a lot is still not entirely known about COVID-19. It depends on the testing modality that one can use. So what we're doing, we're using PCR to really have someone declare negative. The modality of PCR is looking for the genetic material of the virus and whether there is some viral debris. By that we mean if there's anything left behind of the virus, there's a huge possibility that that person may continue to test positive. Are they still infectious? More than likely not, but just because of the sensitivity of the test, that's why we would remain testing positive. And this may not go through for everyone. Will they remain under observation until they're negative? Yes, they will remain under observation. Okay. Uh, and we have lines given to the public on wearing masks. It said that um, a mask should be worn if you're going to be in close contact with other people for 15 minutes or more. Um, so, for example, if you're going to a barber, a hairdresser, a nail technician shop. Um, I don't think any guidance has been given um, for these service providers specifically. So should workers in these businesses also be wearing masks and what about sanitization and the number of people um, allowed in the establishment at the same time? Yes, because for those services, they have a close contact. Because you can't imagine going to your hairdresser and she's here and you're all there, okay, your hair would not get done properly. So for persons in very close contact, it's recommended that both persons wear facial coverings whether it's the cloth mask that is prepared at home, but remember for protection, both persons have to be wearing the cloth mask. So it is recommended. Uh, and I know the minister answered a similar question um, a while ago about this reopening of schools. But I was just wondering what are the conditions um, from the opinion of the Ministry of Health and that would be at stake for the reopening of schools?
but I won't be able to tell you today. So for example, also we had, um, we did screening on say, persons who came in from, from somewhere. Those persons would not have, those persons would have rapids and not necessarily go on to the PCR. So the higher number would be the number of rapid tests? Gradually. Because I'm just saying, 178 now, 183 now, okay? 183 now. But um, and as we go on, that's going to get higher and higher and higher. Because initially we were just doing PCR. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you tell us the age and sex of each COVID-19 uh, positive person? Each person who has tested positive for COVID-19 and so on. No, I'm not going to tell you the age and the sex. Four. Can I have one? Um, rather, I can give you a range. Okay? The difference between knowing the individual age and sex, what's the need for that specific? Rather, we should be looking at a trend. Is it that our population that's becoming sick? Is that different to the other populations? And so, from our information, from the small number we have already, we have an age range of 21 to 67, okay? But can and I ask what is the reason why the ministry is reluctant to say the age and sex of each patient? Because it's the chance. We are very conscious of what happened in the first two cases. And this is not something unique to say this time or say. So it's a very small population. And if you start listing out uh, person A who is this age and this sex and uh, encountered this within this situation, it becomes very easy to identify. And what is the reason? Why do you need to know the age and sex? Is it that you want to be able to identify? Or is it or the public health interest in age and sex? It's for us to determine if our at-risk population is different from somebody else. And so for our interest and for the public's interest, I would think they would want to know who is at risk. Is it that we are only having old persons who have diabetes and hypertension, or are we having young persons who have no pre-existing condition? So for now, and that should be the that should be the aim for persons to understand who is at risk. Am I at risk? For now, we have a range of 21 to 67. We have had no one under the age of 21. We have had persons who have pre-existing conditions and persons without pre-existing conditions. We have had a distribution of males to females of 70% of our males, 60%, uh, 30% of females. And that is something that is consistent with what we are seeing elsewhere. To the extent that you said, why do you want to know? I don't know if that you means. Me can't not necessarily you. Personally. Other I, have no, have I have no personal interest in knowing, but you know, uh, when people have information, they can make certain uh, determinations for themselves. And not necessarily to, like, for instance, the determination about whether or not to wear a mask, you know, based on certain information. But uh, I'm not saying that this age and sex relates to this directly, but uh, I mean, while. Our, government, our ministry has taken that decision, and I'm not commenting on the decision one way or the other. There are other jurisdictions in our region where they have said, well, like for instance, if you see a 39-year-old male tested positive for COVID-19, I could be in that group. But I don't think a 39-year-old male, see, uh, we have a positive test, a 39-year-old male would necessarily um, identify it. That's, that's my view based on that limited information. Okay, I just uh, felt a need to make that uh, clarification. Okay, uh, the third question before I get to the... Uh, yes, before I see the clarification. I did ask this question before, and I think it's appropriate that I ask it again. Uh, how do you, as in the Ministry of Health, and Gendlin, see COVID-19 affecting the country over the next few months uh, say for the rest of the year, especially when scheduled international and regional air travel resumes. So the discussion about um, the resumption of international air travel is going on now. How does it happen? 
and it's definitely something that we are discussing for now. The um, position continues to be that um, anyone coming into St. Vincent and the Grenadines, um, on airlines, you have to wear a mask. That is something the airlines are saying, and this is something we also are saying. When you pass through our airports, whether you leave them or you come in, you wear a mask. And the 14 day quarantine, as of now, remains. However, going forward, in terms of how are we going to manage those persons coming in, are we going to be talking about uh, uh, passports in terms of COVID free? Does that really work? Is that really relevant? How is it going to happen? Those are ongoing discussions. How does it impact the Ministry of Health going forward? So we are launching our, we have launched, we are working on our living well with COVID. And what we're saying is that knowing the disposition of persons with pre-existing conditions, the elderly to be more vulnerable, we are going to ramp up our efforts to ensure that we protect the vulnerable. We're going to wrap up our efforts to make sure we ensure we protect our healthcare workers who are working on the front line. Increasing education, increasing supplies to ensure that we keep our healthcare workers safe and by doing that, keep the rest of the nation. We're working with the Ministry of Education, we're working with business places to guide, advise, come up with something with a protocol of functioning that allows for the safety. So that's, that is our focus now. We need to move forward, but we need to move forward in a way that ensures that we are all safe. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. I just want a clarification from Dr. Duncan. Dr. Duncan, yesterday you said that the source of the community transmission uh, resulted, in, okay, resulted in cases uh, 13 to 17. Uh, that person was an, uh, it was an asymptomatic person. I'm trying to understand. Did this person have a recent travel history? And also, uh, did all of the people uh, this, in this group contract COVID-19 directly from that asymptomatic, asymptomatic? So firstly, that person did have a recent travel history. And secondly, everybody in that group, we could relate to the index case. So either the index case directly affected one or two persons, and those persons went on to infect other persons. So that's why we call it a local transmission. So in each case, we'll be able to trace the infection from a particular source that we know. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Mr. Chan. And there any further questions? Are you from persons who have not asked any questions? Because <laughs> <laughs> we have established the rule already. Three questions for Germany. <laughs> and I guess you were the first person that had your three questions. Well, I think we have come to the end of this press conference. Um, I wish to thank all of the journalists who have asked questions and also to thank the media who are with us, our honorable minister and senior members of the Ministry of Health for being here today. Um, as I always say, it will not be our first or last press conference. We will come to you again to, to inform you and also keep the police informed as the status of COVID-19 clearance in this country. Thank you again.